All right, the Joint Committee, uh, Subcommittee on Infrastructure between uh, the Senate Appropriations Two Committee and the Senate Transportation Committee will be called to order. The clerk will take the roll. Senator Rose. Senator Oberweis. Senator McConkie. Here. Senator Fowler. Senator DeWitt. Here. Senator Curran. Senator Anderson. Senator Villavalam. Here. Senator Sims. Senator McGuire. Here. Senator Kaler. Senator Crow. Here. Senator Collins. Senator Bush. Senator Bertino Tarrant. Senator Bennett. Senator Aquino. Here. Chairman Menard. Here. Chairman Sandoval. Here. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, first, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the Joint Committee would like to thank uh, SIU Edwardsville, uh, Chancellor Pembroke, who I'm assuming is still in the room. There he is, standing in the back, and his team for um, accommodating us on our first uh, statewide hearing outside of Springfield. We had one uh, two weeks ago in the Capitol. This would mark our second. We have several more scheduled, of course, to uh, begin to lay the groundwork for an infrastructure uh, bill, hopefully later this session. Uh, we have three uh, members of the media that have seeked leave to record the hearing. Tony Yuskis from Blue Room Stream, <coughs> Charles Thomas from Riverbender.com, and Joseph Bustos from the Belleville News Democrat seeing no objection, leave is granted. Um, as I mentioned, um, this is our first uh, non-Springfield hearing. Our goal today is to uh, give the Joint Committee members a better understanding of what the needs are here in the Metro East. Uh, so we appreciate uh, the attendance today and uh, appreciate the testimony that's going to be given before the committee. Um, I'd like to in, uh, introduce my very able-bodied co-chair who had the longest commute uh, to Edwardsville today to make a few opening remarks. Co-chair Marty Sandoval, we appreciate you being here. Thank you, uh, co-chair Menard. It's a great, it's an historic moment for me. I finally arrived uh, to Southern Illinois, the Edwardsville campus. I've, I've been to State Center for over 16 years and this is my first visit. So I want to thank John Charles. John Charles, where are you at? John's in the house. John Charles was a former staff of ours. He, you finally got me here, buddy. Thank you. Glad you're here. Thank you very much. And uh, this thing isn't on, but. Yeah, we're good? Yep. And so uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I look forward to working with members of uh, uh, both parties alongside my co chair, Andy Menar, President Cullerton. Uh, said a few months ago as we were uh, awaiting our new governor that uh, he thought it would be a good idea to have these hearings. He asked me to spearhead him and I uh, thought that I didn't want to spearhead him without uh, uh, one of uh, Southern Illinois' finest, uh, Andy Menar, who uh, is a, a guru on our budget, uh, was a guru on our budget team for many years and now a state senator in, here in Southern Illinois. And so uh, I, I think I've, I, I've got a great partner. Uh, we don't dance or sing. Uh, we yeah. sing about a carry. Okay, once in a while. Um, and uh, look forward to hearing the testimony of uh, the needs of our folks down south as well as uh, some of the uh, ideas that uh, some of you might have in regards to financing uh, these projects that you are going to suggest we should uh, invest in. I, I also like to take a moment to uh, uh, ask our minority leaders who with the leave of Co-Chair Menard uh, uh, for some opening statements. So I'm, I'm first the Senate a Minority Leader uh, on the Transportation Committee, uh, Senator Don DeWitt. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'll be very brief. Um, I, too, would like to add my thank you to uh, SIU Edwardsville for hosting this event this afternoon. Uh, if it's any indication, like Springfield's hearing last week, uh, the demand is great, and uh, there's a lot of information that needs to get laid out today, so uh, I won't extend my remarks, and hopefully we can get right to it. I also want to take this opportunity just to introduce uh, Another one of our uh, senators, Paul Shimp from Waterloo, Illinois, is with us this afternoon. Paul came over from, uh, from Waterloo. He's not a member of the subcommittee, but we're certainly uh, happy to have him with us. And uh, 
Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Sandoval, for uh, opening it up for Senator Schimpf in the case, in the event he has any questions uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Senator McConkie, who is the minority spokesperson for the Senate Appropriations Two Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a real privilege to be here. You know, one of the things that uh, I'm always, uh, always marvel at is just how d economically diverse our state is. And obviously, while there's a lot of needs across the state, uh, the way in which we pay for those needs uh, needs to reflect kind of the capacity of various areas of the state. So I look forward to uh, any sort of uh, creative dialogue that we can have as well uh, in regards to the ways in which uh, we can do this in a way that is productive for all the citizens across the state, uh, not just in what we're investing in, but how we're asking for it to be paid for. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, before I announce the agenda, I would also like to extend the opportunity to uh, Senator Rochelle Crow. Uh, we are uh, being hosted, I guess, in large part by her in uh, the 56th district to make opening remarks. Senator Crow. Thank you, Senator Menard, and, and please don't let me take any of the offender away from SIUE. You are hosting us today, and, and I thank you for that. I want to say briefly that um, before session even began this year, I began along with my state representatives who are in the room today, Representative Stewart, Representative Bristow, along with other senators here in the region, Senator Menard and Senator Belt, to meet with our local mayors, our educational institution, our labor and other stakeholders to talk about the possibility of a capital bill. And each of those conversations ended with the concern, we just want to make sure that Southern Illinois is not forgotten. So I sincere, give my sincere thanks to the committee for traveling here today as evidence to all of us that Southern Illinois is not forgotten and I look forward to hearing from all of you today. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I do want to extend um, courtesy of recognizing Representative Katie Stewart, who is with us in the audience, and uh, Representative Monica Bristow. Um, if she's, there she is. Monica, thank you both for attending. All right, we will have, uh, we will have five panels. Uh, that's the intent of the co-chairs. Uh, the first will uh, focus on the impact of state-supported economic development. Uh, the second will focus on the needs of higher education. The third will focus on workforce uh, stakeholders uh, that would be impacted by infrastructure investment or a capital bill. Uh, the fourth uh, would focus on transportation infrastructure needs. And then finally, uh, we will hear from mayors uh, in the Metro East region. So um, let's begin with the impact of state supported economic development. Um, if Mr. Kyle Harfst, Executive Director of Southern Illinois Research Park, Mr. Tim Sullivan, uh, the SIU Edwardsville Economics and Finance Department uh, representative would come forward and we will welcome your testimony. Gentlemen, if you could sit in the middle for me, that would be good. Oh, she is. Okay. All right. I also neglected to introduce Representative Terry Bryant, who I'm told is here in the audience as well. There's Terry. Thanks for coming, Terry. All right. Senator Peters, now, now I'm getting, these are all audibles. <laughs> <laughs> Senator, there he is. Senator Robert Peters uh, made the trip from Chicago as well. Thank you, Senator, for attending. All right, gentlemen, um, if you would introduce yourselves, your titles, and please proceed your testimony, and then we'll do questions uh, following uh, the conclusion of your testimony. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Timothy Sullivan. I'm a faculty member in the SIUE Department of Economics and Finance and I am director of SIUE's Office of Regional Economic Analysis. Uh, please let me start by welcoming all of you to our beautiful campus and thanking you for allowing me to speak with you about the importance of the capital appropriations bill to our local economy. Public universities are often the economic lifeblood of their communities. At the same time that they train the next generation of workers and leaders, they act as important drivers of their regional economies and Southern Illinois University Edwardsville is no exception. It is, for example, the second largest employer in the Metro East region, and in my most recent economic impact study, I estimated very conservatively that SIUE has an economic impact in our region of over half a billion dollars per year. Regarding the impact of the capital bill, until the specifics of the projects and timelines are determined, it's, it's not possible for me to provide pre precise estimates of the economic impact. 
but the projects that are being discussed would likely generate between 20 million and 30 million dollars per year uh, of economic impact to the Metro East economy, along with hundreds of jobs in the region that wouldn't otherwise exist. Now, the immediate impact of these projects is somewhat obvious. Hundreds of jobs in construction and trades, followed by many additional jobs and paychecks and other industries that are indirectly affected by the capital bill as the expenditures work their way through the, our local economy. But equally important, these types of projects improve our facilities and allow us to maintain and grow our programs, uh, especially in, in occupations in which we face worker shortages that hamper our local economy. In many cases, these programs allow us to keep students in Illinois rather than seeing them leave for other states never to return. And ultimately, these types of projects allow us to provide the best education possible to the next generation of workers. And without a doubt, one of the few things, the very few things that all economists would agree upon is that an educated population is the most surefire way of increasing productivity, wages, and tax revenues. So in conclusion, there's no doubt of the role that state appropriations to SIUE play in our local economy. My most recent estimates suggest that for every one dollar of state appropriations to SIUE, when leveraged with other sources of revenue, generates over eight dollars of economic impact to our region. That's a pretty good rate of return. So thank you again for giving me this opportunity, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the committee and guests. My name is Kyle Harvest. I serve as Executive Director of Economic Development at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. I was asked to speak today regarding the impact that the capital bill would have on Southern Illinois and the state economy. My comments today will focus on the Southern Illinois region and specifically SIU Carbondale. As stated by Alexander, universities are associations of scholars and teachers engaged in acquiring, communicating, or advancing knowledge, pursuing in a liberal spirit the various sciences which are preparation for the professions or higher educations of life. As part of this activity, universities are economic drivers. I was one of the co-authors on the most recent study of the economic impact of Southern Illinois University Carbondale. The impact of the university on the entire state at that point in time was $2.3 billion. In other words, uh, for every dollar appropriated by the state, approximately four sixty-five dollars worth of economic activity in the southern and central region of the state was generated. Statewide, that closer was similar to Tim at an $8 um, number. I was told by our campus administration that we have almost $300 million in needed capital projects today. This does not include all the needed deferred maintenance for existing structures throughout campus. If a capital bill were to be improved and universities would be able to obtain much needed resources, what is the impact? I think that's the question today. Well, in preparation for today, I looked at several other universities in other states to see what their impacts were for capital projects. For example, the University of Nebraska looked at construction costs for four projects totaling $456 million, not too far from SIU Carbondale. Their estimated impact included the creation of more than 6,000 construction jobs, total impact of $730 million, and state sales and income taxes of $9.4 million dollars resulting from the labor income. This return is nearly two to one for the investment made uh, from the state of Nebraska. Arizona State University conducted a similar study to determine the economic activity resulting from 1.4 billion dollars of university construction results. A total of 31,000 jobs in construction and otherwise created during this time period, an immediate addition of 828 million GSP would result. The study added that there are several primary channels that distinguish economic impact from research universities from that of other agencies. Those include the added human capital acquired by students who enroll at the university, activity that fosters innovation and entrepreneurship, and serves as both a catalyst for existing private business and as an attractor for new private investments and relocations. These examples from two other states can be easily interpreted, interpreted or replicated for Illinois. The point is that there are gains in the private and public sectors through investment in capital projects. When you leverage capital projects with universities, 
history tells us that synergies with respect to capital projects is, exist in higher education. So whether it's $1 billion or $100 billion for a capital campaign, the effect is that the Illinois economy will benefit from this investment. In closing, this de decade has been difficult for higher education and commerce in Illinois. During the two-year budget impasse, many Illinoisans lost confidence in state government and higher education. Universities in this state are still feeling the effects of this. I've been at Southern Illinois University Carbondale for 25 years, and the past four years have been the most difficult from a fiscal and programmatic perspective. A capital bill for the state and for higher education would increase confidence and demonstrate that our state is willing to invest in our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Questions from uh, members for Mr. Harfst or Mr. Sullivan? Senator McGuire. Thank you, Chairman. Our Good afternoon. I'm from Joliet, an area which, like yours, has, is still reeling from the effects of what the academics call deindustrialization, when big factories closed. So could you tell us, please, about any uh, 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 movement by your campuses to develop programs to prepare men and women for jobs in the new economy? I will, of course, uh, leave it to other uh, folks to, to talk about with greater, uh, great, with greater uh, specificity. But of course, we, we are constantly revising our programs to try to ask ourselves, what are, what are the next batch of jobs, right? Where are, where are the jobs? And of course, uh, as, as many of you, I'm sure, know, uh, engineering, STEM, nursing, those, of course, are fields that uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the federal government projects are going to be fast growing. And of course, uh, <clears throat> we're lucky enough here to have a, a great nursing school, a great engineering program, and uh, to try to uh, impart some of the, what we're requesting through the capital bill is, uh, are, are, are things that might help us grow those programs. And again, with the goal being that uh, we provide opportunity for students in the region, that uh, they don't have to leave the area in order to pursue their education, and that then hopefully we can keep them here after they complete their education uh, again, as, as uh, workers and taxpayers to the state of Illinois. I'll, I'll defer part of the, the question to uh, uh, Chancellor Dunn. He'll be asked to provide some comments later. But one uh, very recent example is um, nursing in very deep southern Illinois. There's a, there's a strong nursing shortage. And so the, the university has partnered with Southern Illinois Healthcare, which is the largest healthcare pro provider, uh, to look at go ahead and go forward in creating a Bachelor of Science in Nursing program. It's, it's a win-win for all, all involved. Uh, the administrative, the infrastructure is available uh, with an existing department, and uh, the, the largest supporter, SIH, Southern Illinois Healthcare, is, is willing to help fund for tuition in addition to a large capital outlay. So you mentioned um, job opportunities in nursing and engineering. Are those capital intensive majors? I, you know what, I, I'm going to be honest here as an economist. I, I can't say that I've studied the, uh, the, the academics of, of which fields are, are, are more capital intensive. Now, obviously, they're capital intensive in the sense of uh, things such as equipment okay. and, and things of that nature. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further questions? All right, thank you, gentlemen. All right, next uh, we will um, have the panel on higher education. I'd like to welcome Dr. Kevin Dorsey, who is the SIU System President as a witness, Randy Pembroke, Chancellor of SIU Edwardsville, Mr. John Dunn, the new Interim Chancellor at SIU Carbondale, Lori Williams, SIU School of Medicine Assistant Provost for Clinical and External Affairs, Dr. Dale Chapman, right on time, President of Lewis and Clark Community College, and Mr. Nick Mance uh, from Southwestern Illinois College. All right, we got a full house here. We're going to start on our right with uh, Dr. Dorsey. If you would introduce yourself um, after, uh, what we'll do is we'll take questions after everybody uh, makes their presentation. Um, so when it gets to your point, just introduce yourself and then you can proceed with your uh, presentation, Dr. Dorsey. Yeah, I'm Kevin Dorsey, the interim president of the SIU system, uh, a comprehensive educational enterprise that includes 
schools of law, medicine, dentistry, nursing, and pharmacy. For us, a capital bill is about an investment in our students, both current and future. It is what speaks to prospective students and faculty and says that we value them. It helps us attract and retain students, not only from Illinois, but from all over the world. As you're probably aware, higher education is an incredibly competitive market. For the SIU system campuses to compete, we need these critical investments that you're about to hear described. I believe uh, each of you have a, a, a packet of information that details our capital requests. And at this time, I'll uh, turn it over to the, the chancellors of the campuses and the spokesman for the School of Medicine. Thank you, President Dorsey. Uh, again, I would like to uh, welcome you to our campus. It's good to have you here. Our uh, capital uh, project requests involve um, the uh, nursing building and the allied health structure. Uh, these are important in terms of employment and uh, training to, to keep people in the area. We also uh, have a capital uh, request relating to a dental facility uh, in Alton, which is one of three campuses uh, uh, of the SIUE University. The additional things that are on our list uh, relate to ongoing maintenance. The SIUE campus was created in the 1960s and almost all of our facilities went up between 1965 and 1970. So 100 year buildings, 50 year renovation schedule, uh, those things are uh, required to be reviewed. So the uh, Founders Hall, Alumni Hall uh, will need uh, renovation and we're in the process of doing that. But uh, additional things such as uh, sidewalks, uh, our um, hydrants and uh, water system also need to, to be reviewed as well. So I would be happy to uh, take questions later about capital requests. Thank you. Mr. Dunn. Good afternoon. John Dunn. I'm the interim chancellor at uh, Southern Illinois University Carbondale. I've been with you now since uh, January 1. Is this your first, uh, this is your first official hearing? It yes, is my done. first Very official good. hearing, although I must say that 2002 to 2007, I was the Provost Vice Chancellor and Interim Chancellor at Carbondale. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before you, we have as our, our number one capital request, uh, really mass communication and media arts building, which was built many years ago. We've produced a number of outstanding students, professionals in those fields. And as we all know, uh, the fields of uh, mass communication and media arts have changed rather dramatically uh, during uh, the last several years. Uh, it's no longer a print world necessarily. It's more of a, of a media world in the, in the sense of technology and having uh, the appropriate uh, settings to properly educate <coughs> students. Uh, the building, uh, in fact, was constructed in 1964. It has not been significantly remodeled since that time. It's an $83 million request. We also have a request for a College of Agricultural Sciences. As you know, we view ourselves as the agricultural college for the southern half of the state, and we're very proud of that. Uh, the growers, producers um, are uh, cognizant of what we do for them. Uh, again, that facility was built in 1955. Uh, at that time, it was primarily a teaching for undergraduate students, so we've morphed now into a very nice, uh, uh, graduate programs and also excellent uh, laboratories that we need to continue our research. Right now we're distributed across campus. We'd like to bring all that back together. We have a third uh, request and of course that uh, too is a, a very expensive one, Neckers, which is our science building. That's a $98 million request. So in addition to the, the, the need for capital construction, we have deferred maintenance of uh, over $700 million. Uh, we are celebrating our sesquicentennial anniversary this year. Uh, we've been alive and well for 150 years, but we also in, in 150 years have infrastructure that needs attention, help, and support. And to pick up on the uh, comment added, uh, made earlier, we are trying constantly to reinvent ourselves. We're into a major reorganization of the university, breaking down silos, rethinking in terms of what should be the structures that allow disciplines to come together, professions to come together, to be more responsive, really, to the, the needs of, uh, of society today. 
And finally, one last thing I'd say, visually, we need cranes on our campus. Cranes on the campus send a powerful message to the public at large that we're alive and well, we're working forward, and we're creating jobs, not only which will help our students, but equally important, provide hundreds and hundreds of jobs for individuals that are looking for good work, good jobs, and good opportunities. So we thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Ms. Williams. Hi, Lori Williams, Associate Provost for External Relations at SIU School of Medicine. And we come to you with um, one primary request for capital funding, which is a new education building on our campus in Springfield. Um, the education building will provide student classrooms, tutor rooms, and updated learning spaces for our 293 medical students, 330 residents and fellows, 80 physician assistant students, 350 faculty, and 1,500 staff. This new building will house our problem-based learning classrooms, our tutor rooms, simulated patient laboratories, seminar and lecture facilities, academic offices, and offices for community education and outreach. This building will give the SIU School of Medicine the capacity to increase the physician and healthcare workforce production for our region. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chapman. Hi. Uh uh, Dale Chapman, uh, president of the Lewis and Clark Community College. Uh, you know, basically, um, the college was founded in 1970, but our buildings go back to the uh, early 1800s. Uh, so it was the second oldest women's college in the nation. I think I passed around a building that kind of shows you what the campus looks like there. Uh, and uh, we have 13,000 students, uh, an economic impact on the region of $370 million a year, responsible for 1,000 graduates a year about uh, 6,600 6, jobs in the region, and 38 career programs and everything from nursing to process operations technology to automotive tech and dental hygiene and welding and a whole range of career, uh, career technical programs. And our uh, request is for uh, uh, the main complex building uh, is a 116,000 square foot building uh, constructed in 1890. by the great uh, St. Louis architect, uh, uh, Theodore Link, who built the Union Station over in, across the river. He built this, this one before, uh, and it's uh, on the National Register of Historic Buildings, and it is a, 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 an amazing one-of-a-kind facility. It houses uh, all of our, uh, our liberal arts classrooms, library, uh, computer labs, uh, enrollment services, financial aid, uh, faculty and staff offices. It's sort of a critical building for us. Uh, and, you know, we think a lot in these day and age about uh, green buildings, and we're, we have uh, goal level of certified green buildings on campus, but the greenest building is actually re 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 rehabilitating uh, an historic building of this, of this character and, and, and nature. So uh, that's our number one capital project. Thank you. Mr. Mance. Okay. My name is uh, Nick Mance. I'm the president of Southwestern Illinois College in uh, Belleville and Grand City and Red Bud. Um, roughly, we, we are a large college, one of the larger colleges. We, we've got about 16,000 students. We cover about eight counties. Um, again, our, our buildings are uh, fairly old. Our main complex was built in the 1960s. Uh, it needs major renovation. We've got issues with our... Uh, um, ground control, I guess, water control, uh, utilities, sewers, and water. Uh, so, uh, you know, our renovation projects are, are quite a bit. We estimate about a little over $100 million. Uh, our major needs are for a biology, chemistry, and engineering laboratory for our nursing program, which is uh, expanded and is full, and we're turning away um, applicants as far as nursing goes. And we have a large welding program, including uh, manufacturing technology, processing. Um, we have a, a large programmable controllers, and our aviation program is expanding. So 
our needs are quite a bit in the biology labs and chemistry labs um, and also engineering. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be invited here and glad to see everybody, all the senators. So glad to meet you. All right, thank you. Uh, questions for this panel from members? Senator Crow. Thank you, Chairman Menard. My question is directed towards our community college presidents, Chapman and Mance. How might we use a capital bill to enhance our trade-based education efforts? Well, you know, about 65% of our students are in the career technical trade areas. Uh, we have uh, seek vertical integration between the high school career trades uh, and sort of get them on a pathway for a career. So welding uh, in the high schools and then dual credit so it keeps them out of debt and they also is free to the students in, in high school. That is to vertically then get them into welding programs and various certifications and so then they go into industry. In our region we sort of supply the whole region with, uh, you know, with, with uh, career, career trade people. So uh, what we, you know, every, every uh, career program now has a simulator. There, there are thousands of dollars of, of, of costs. You know, we have a major nursing program uh, and, uh, you know, replacing two simulators now, a couple hundred thousand dollars for the simulators. Uh, truck driver training has simulators, welding has simulators. It's all muscle memory and angle of attack and things of that nature. So, uh, you know, all these uh, career programs are very technically expensive. And uh, so facilities uh, are a key, like you've heard today. To uh, piggyback on, on uh, Mr. Chapman, Dr. Chapman, uh, again, our vocational and technical programs are large. We, we produce uh, hundreds of students. In fact, we had Manufacturing Day about uh, two months ago, and we had almost uh, 400 high school students come through manufacturing day to look at our aviation program, our programmable controllers. We got a large miniature uh, bottling line that we use for bottling for like Anheuser-Busch or, well, it's now it's InBev. Uh, so our vocational programs are really strong. Our nurse, like I said, our nursing program is running out of space from the standpoint that our labs are are outdated and we have to turn away applicants. So it's very important on the vocational side for workforce development that, that we proceed with those that, that push because that's where the advancement of students are, are going. You know, they're going into vocational training. Thank you. Further questions? Senator Villavala. Close enough. Close enough? Thank you. <laughs> A little, right. little, uh, little harder than Senator Bernard, right? <laughs> thank know. you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you all for coming here and, and testifying as to the needs. Just had a couple questions. Um, obviously, the last four years have been difficult. Uh, can you speak to uh, how, if there are any capital projects or um, requests that you're making today um, that were delayed or that you all were thinking of over the last four years, um, but were uh, impossible because of what happened um, with the budget impasse. All of you. <laughs> well, I think uh, everything that you see before us, and I can't speak for anyone other than Carbondale, these are requests that we've had for a long time. We just have not had any support uh, provided to make this happen. Um, our nursing program, I am very pleased that Southern Illinois Healthcare uh, has stepped forward not only with uh, the commitment uh, to support the program, but with dollars. And those are the kinds of things that we need. So it's a, a lot of private public partnerships to make things happen, to make things happen in the right way. Uh, and while I have um, uh, the opportunity, uh, um, again, thinking about the future, occupational therapy, physical therapy, those are two fields that we clearly are developing on our campus and we need to, uh, to make sure that we're responsive to, to the needs that are out there. I, I would say that uh, as it relates to the Allied Health and Nursing Center, uh, a, a large part of that is simulation labs, and it's very important in uh, training to stay up to date, uh, cutting edge in those areas. So we have had that in our plans for a number of years, and hopefully that can move forward. And as, as far as uh, SWIT goes, 
our projects were uh, put on the board back in 2011, 2012, and they were revised back in 2014, and so they just keep rolling forward. But, but again, to um, emphasize the Chancellor's uh, uh, comments on allied health and nursing, it's critical for those labs and simulation areas. We have about four projects that were shovel ready uh, that got you know basically stalled out. Those projects are still on the books. Thank you. Yeah, actually, you, and this may be true for others as well, but you've already made a, a commitment of five million dollars for planning for the MICMA building, the Mass Communication Media Arts. Now, those plans are there, um, but again, the fu the funding to make that happen has not been uh, provided. Thank you. All right. Further questions? Co-Chair Sandoval. Thank you, uh, Chairman R. So I, just for a second, uh, we're going to try to accommodate. I'd like to get Kyle, Carl, and Tim back up on the stand here. You guys can stay. I want Kyle and Tim. Did they leave already? Yep. Come on, boys. Why don't you come up front? <laughs> Forgot to ask you a couple of questions. It's related to, to them. If we can get them a couple chairs. Put this one guy th between two community colleges here. Yes, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you for accommodating. So, um, and we all can chime in. So, uh, Mr. Harft and Mr. Sullivan. So, you guys are the policy wonks. You guys have the you're the the economists, and these guys are a little too smart for me. Yeah. I'm just a just a center from Chicago. So, I, I need to ask you. So, um, there's just always uh, this. Uh, challenge between uh, competing dollars for roads and bridges and institutions like Southern Illinois. Most of our uni universities are uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line. And so uh, should we, uh, I, my, my estimation is that the majority of their dollars, I mean, you have a tough time competing against roads and bridges. Is that, is that not the case? Or would you have any information on that? Thanks. <laughs> I'm a, I'd like to preface that with he's an economist. I'm a, an economist wannabe, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. So both are truly valuable and very important with the decaying bridges and roads. You know, that needs attention. And so I, I don't want to frame this as an either or question, uh, but in terms of the value, in, in terms of $1 for capital development equals what? So in looking at, you know, what is the economic impact of providing construction dollars? The shorter answer is it's somewhere about two to one. If you look at it as just a pure investment in terms of what the return is going to be, and that's not based on my information, but that's based on other economists. If we're looking at if you invest in a university, what does that return get you? And earlier I talked about just for Southern Illinois and Central Illinois, if the state invests a dollar, they get about $4.65 back. But for the entire state, that it, that grows larger uh, to about $7 is returned. And I think Tim had said for Ed the Edwardsville campus, it was about $8. So the, the reason for the difference is because that dollar is leveraged in so many different programs, whether it's teaching students, uh, research, non-academic activities when, where I'm involved with. So for example, the office that I work in, we help, among other things, uh, businesses get started as well as expand and grow in addition to working with university students who want to create real businesses as they're there. So before the budget impasse, um, throughout Southern Illinois, we worked with about 500 clients per year. Um, we ended up, during the budget impasse and then after, that number was closer to 200 clients per year. And that's in large part because we had a severe reduction just in our one unit. So by reducing the university allocation from the state, you're reducing not only the ability to, to teach students and to conduct research, but also to provide the stewardship for the outreach activities. So, you know, again, I don't view this as an either or situation, but I do know from a university perspective, you're gonna get much more than that two to one investment. I, I would just agree with that, but I, I would say any construction expenditure or capital expenditure is obviously is, is going to impact the economy. If nothing else, we know the people actually doing the work will, will be employed. 
But then, of course, the question you should always ask yourself is, well, what are we going to have after it's built? Right? Uh, what, what's at, once, once the construction workers have gone home, what are we going to have? And obviously, roads and highways are also important pieces of infrastructure. And they, they make the, the economy move more efficiently. We can move goods and services around more efficiently. But uh, it's tough to compete with what you get from a college or a university. And again, this is not just because of uh, its infrastructure, but because it trains the next generation. That's, that's what's so important, right? And so uh, roads, bridges are important pieces of infrastructure, but it's really tough to compete when it comes to getting that multiplier long term with, uh, with something that contributes to the education of the workforce. Just one real example, I guess, uh, that I would add. Uh, Kansas City Southern Railroad uh, is looking at a major logistics center in our district in Jersey County. It will affect all of our district. It will affect every, every you know, the complete metropolitan area. And they have 3,000 miles of track uh, in the United States. They have 3,500 miles of track in Mexico. So all the plants in Mexico will be sending their products to, to America to finish, uh, you know, the, to start with 1,000 jobs. So in order to have that logistics center there, it'll take roads for intermodal uh, logistics kinds of uh, staging and things of that nature. Uh, so they're willing to make that investment if the roads are going to be there. Well, that obviously community colleges and universities are going to be in a sort of a fast follow mode supplying those that, that technical workforce you know, for that logistics center. So I think <coughs> roads and higher education kind of, you know, go together. Yeah, you bet. So, you know, you're uh, sitting in a major NAFTA corridor here in Southern Illinois, I mean, uh, and people don't really realize that uh, our trade partner in Mexico is very important to, to Southern Illinois. Absolutely. Uh, it, Mexico is uh, Illinois' number one client for uh, corn, soybean, beef, uh, heavy equipment, and it all comes right through here. Uh, so I imagine that many folks would uh, say that uh, a dollar spent on a road and bridge is probably better spent than in a classroom. May I um, add something to that? You know, think about this, Oliver. We prepare the engineers. We do the research on what are the composite materials that will go into the road, how to build better bridges that will last longer, that will allow, that will allow the public to enjoy a better, safer road and bridges for a longer period of time. So I, I kind of agree. I think this all works together, and somehow we need to figure out better ways to make that happen. I was just curious on that because there's it's this constant uh, yeah. conflict, challenge between. I, I, we see it uh, in Chicago, and um, as, as chairman of transportation, some of our downstates. Uh, I never, as chairman of transportation, I I, uh, I hardly ever get a visit by a university that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> asking for a buck for a campus, a campus building. I, I usually, uh, most of my visits are for roads, bridges, highways, and yeah. local roads. And so it's kind of kind of interesting. So I thought I'd ask the question. Thank you for the responses. You, you, could, you could stick around. There may be some ancillary questions. Um, uh, President uh, Dorsey, <coughs> great to see you again. So for every dollar that Southern Illinois gets, for example, in the past, uh, under uh, Pat Quinn, under his capital bill, uh, which was uh, 2009, we were we put that together. What was it called? Illinois, Illinois Jobs, Jobs Now. It seems so long ago. For every dollar that Southern Illinois, Southern Illinois University received, uh, how many came to this campus? Not a clue. I'd have to get with my folks and find out. How about uh, uh, Chancellor Dunn? You, you, you I, I, again, I'm not sure I could probably answer that for another place that I was as a president until a few months ago, but uh, I, I really don't know the answer to that. I do worry. I'm a, I'm a Pinckneyville native. I'm a Southern Illinois native. I do worry that Southern Illinois has, and I, I, I really appreciate the fact that we're here, because I think you communicated earlier, it's about the entire state. And uh, it seems to me at times we have been uh, omitted from the equation. And um, wherever I've been, I've observed that from a distance, and it bothers me. So when it comes to roads, could you get a greater share than folks in 
Chicago, you, it's a 60-40 split, although the folks in Chicago uh, contribute more than uh, uh, the majority of the, into mm -hmm. the road fund, but you get the majority investment in downstate Illinois. Yeah, thank I don't you. Know if you know that. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Um, talk to me about, so you don't know the split between uh, uh, the investments that, uh, for every dollar that Southern Illinois gets, how much of it goes to its sister campuses or this campus. I'm advised that this has, this campus has the majority of student population. Is that correct? There, go ahead. Uh, yeah, as of this fall, SIUE has uh, around 13,200, and I think Carbondale is 12,800. Head, head count. 13,000 in Edwardsville and? 13,2 and 12,8. 12, and uh, that's head count. With that, with that uh, can we uh, conclude that then uh, Edwardsville should get the majority of the, of the investment? Because here's where their need's at. Sure. I'd like to see the answer. Sure, I'm sure you would. Yeah. <laughs> that's and that's been a bone of contention, clearly, oh, because, been. yeah, uh, I think the way the the state dollars were split was based on a historical calculation. Um, in rough numbers, I think it was 60-40. Uh, clearly, Carbondale's population has been declining in students. Edwardsville has risen. But I think adjustments have not been made accordingly. As a result of that, our Board of Trustees commissioned a study by a, an outside neutral group to look at this. And hopefully, within the next month, we should have early indications of what the factors and uh, uh, figures should be to, to balance this out. The problem will be if there's a big money shift from one to another, if you advantage one campus and kill the other, that's basically a zero-sum game and that doesn't do anybody any good. I might add, um, though, in uh, 200 top research universities, we are still ranked number 110 in production of doctoral students. That's a very expensive proposition. So it's not based only on headcount. It's not based wholly on FTE. It's based on lower division, upper division, master's degree, doctoral degree, and professional programs. And all of those factors, among many, many others, have to be uh, weighed in on this. I, I was just looking at your capita request, and it's pretty lopsided when it compares to the investments here at Ezraville versus uh, Southern Illinois, the Carbondale campus. I mean, there's two to one, three to one. Well, again, we're 150, 150 years old, and the sesquicentennial six. campaign uh, makes it pretty clear we've been in business a long time. And uh, both our, our infrastructure needs and our capital needs, which have not been attended to for many years, need help. What is, Mr. President, what, what is your share of capital investments from the university side? Yeah, I think it's, what is it? It's uh, capital. It's capital. Oh, yeah, yeah the, the question is capital. Yeah, I mean. uh, Dr. Stuckey is the CFO for the system, and I don't believe he's here, but he could answer that boom like that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I would imagine it's minimal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very, very minimal. You pretty much rely on a capital, a state capital program for your capital investments and deferred maintenance as opposed to yeah, we're, uh, we're in the middle of a, of a campaign, however, on fundraising, and uh, uh, currently our goal was $75 million. We're currently at $72 million. We have another half year to go. We have many alumni and friends, and they do invest in not only scholarships, but also occasionally some buildings. So, you know, that's good stuff. That's good for everybody. It's good for the state. I'd like to just, uh, I looked at some information that, that tells me that 17% of your student population is African American, roughly. Overall, is that correct? Uh, uh, ours is uh, about 13 to 14 percent over the last two or three years. And what is your Hispanic student population? About 4 percent, between about 4, 4 and 5. Has that been growing? Uh, that has been fairly flat for the last uh, four or five years, Senator. And um, the, the part that has been growing is the percentage uh, of students that indicate two or more uh, ethnic uh, areas as their background. And has there been an increase in international students? Um, 
for us, it's been basically flat uh, the last few years. Uh, and I would say that it's getting harder uh, to keep that uh, flat number in terms of recruiting international students. In the international market, the United States has been declining the last four years in international students of all universities. Canada is exploding, just absolutely exploding. Mr. President, so, so tell me about, um, or Chancellor, Chancellor Dunn, so tell me about the diversity of your uh, senior team. Is it, do you have any African Americans on your senior uh, team? Yes, uh, we do, uh, African American male, and we have um, four women out of seven. So you have uh, four African Americans? No, 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 no. Four. Four women. Women. Right. Are they right. white women? Right. And the Af get back to the African Americans. How, uh, what positions do they have? Uh, the the uh, women, uh, the chief financial officer, chief uh, student affairs officer, also the head of enrollment management, and uh, oh, uh, uh, mass communication. Uh, uh, and Development Foundation dual job, and then the individual that's the African American is the head of our uh, Associate Chancellor for Diversity. No other positions, uh, no other senior management positions. We're pretty lean. Yeah. <laughs> Any Hispanics? Um, again, I've been there two months. Um, we certainly have Hispanics in our faculty ranks, and. Um, probably as deans and department chairs, but I'm, I can't answer that for you. But I'd be happy to provide you with that information. Yeah, you know, I've been harping. I've been, uh, w w some of us on this committee have been, uh, uh, been at the vanguard of trying to uh, uh, bring diversity, apply diversity to the vanguard of uh, the universities. Uh, we just had our, our new governor, J.B. Pritzker, Governor Pritzker, announced in his budget address that he uh, is going to ensure that minorities and women and veterans and disabled get their fair share of, mm -hmm. of state contracts. And um, just I want to belabor the position, the, the issue, but you know, there is a law on the books. There's a law on the books, uh, the Business Enterprise Program. It's a law, it's a state statute mm -hmm. that states that 20% of your spend uh, shall be made uh, with minority vendors. And uh, your last report. Uh, shows you uh, just a shy above 3.5. No, ours, ours is at 11% and 218. And if we were to include those who are not BEP certified, it takes it to 22%. So we're working hard. One of our goals is to get more of the uh, population certified and to encourage them to do that. So, for instance, uh, last week we had uh, uh, Black Caucus uh, businesses on campus. Uh, we have uh, a meeting coming up with Black Chamber on our campus. Uh, uh, these are all efforts to do, I think, consistent with what you're requesting. We need to do better. We need to do more. Yeah, well, I'm just looking at your report. It says 3.7. You, you have some other report? I love well, you. Mine that. is based on the Carbondale campus, so I don't okay, know if, right. what that report I is. I have the overall report that yeah, the I, university submitted. It says uh, uh, BEP percent achieved 3.7 percent. So uh, I'll be happy. I'll, I'll give to, you mine. I'll give yeah. you mine, too. You can look at S that. Senator, in the uh, last year for the Edwardsville campus, uh, we were at 99.7 percent of the 20 percent goal. So we were uh, almost exactly uh, what the goal uh, espouses. So if you were to receive additional funding for capital and if you were to follow the law and if you were to follow the, uh, the vision of uh, our new governor, J.B. Pritzker, um, w what improvements structurally have you uh, have implemented to ensure that minority women and veteran owned firms uh, get their fair share? So from a construction standpoint, we require 20% uh, subcontracting uh, on construction projects. We have hired individuals uh, to contact minority vendors. That is their job to be uh, calling whenever we have projects that are uh, there. And uh, we have a search in progress uh, for a coordinator 
for our BEP uh, initiative. So you're you're uh, you're going to stick to the state law 20 percent. You're not going to you're not even. We're not going to violate the law, sir. But you're, you would never go above and beyond the law, right? That would be wouldn't that a be great? Good thing. Yeah. And and by the way, we have a new person. It's a procurement person. This is their assignment. We've got to get more registered, and we have to reach out more. Yeah, we either one of you know what the population of the, the, the African American population in Illinois is? Um, no, percentage-wise, maybe it's about fifteen percent. Yeah. Uh, would you know about the Hispanic population in Illinois? <coughs> no. I would say twenty-five. It's about seventeen percent okay. statewide, right? Statewide. Yeah. You know, I look forward to. Uh, you know, many folks have commented just not most recently that uh, perhaps we should not award any capital dollars to any universities that don't meet the state law. That was a novel concept. Um, what's your reaction, Mr. Chancellor? I think we have a responsibility to comply with what, and I'm still in the learning stages of this, yeah. but I don't, I don't disagree with that. We think we are uh, meeting that standard uh, in, in the last year. We were excited. We more than tripled the spending in that area. And uh, if you come back in a week, this room will be uh, full. We have a, uh, a minority vendor fair uh, that we're hosting to try to make sure that uh, uh, all the individuals in this area that are interested in our contracts uh, know about the things that are going on here. Do you have capacity building grants with uh Minority advocacy agent organizations that could help you. You know, there's organizations like the Hispanic American Construction Industry Association, you know, who, like the IDOT and Tollway and other uh, state agencies, provide uh, grants to so that they can help with the pipeline, um, or Black Contractors United, or Federation of Women Contractors, or Asian American. Contractor Association or, you know, some veteran organizations, they do exist. You don't have to do the work yourself. Uh, you just got to reach out and partner with some of these organizations and institutions. And, uh, and um, you know, and, and by the way, we have lists, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of certified minority firms uh, by the state. Yeah, you don't have to go look for them. If you need the list, I'll provide it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fortune. Thank you. Further questions for this panel? Senator Shim. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Menard. Thank you for uh, letting me ask a question, even though I'm, I'm not on the, on the subcommittee here. I'll just keep it very, very brief. Uh, from, for the uh, committee members, I represent the 58th Senate District, which is about half an hour south of here, but it goes down about two and a half hours south than really most of uh, southwestern Illinois. And one of the things that I have learned since I've been the state senator is that really with southern Illinois, there is almost a symbiotic relationship with SIU Carbondale. You know, as SIU Carbondale goes, so goes southern Illinois and vice versa. So what, I, what I'd like to just have you briefly educate the members on is a little bit about what what you are doing at SIU Carbondale, uh, just not just for the university, but for the region as a whole. Because there's not, it's not like there is a choice between we give the money to the university or we give the money to the region. Uh, you know, just tell the committee here a little bit about what you do to help Southern Illinois as a whole outside of the university. Uh, thank you very much. We uh, do have a major responsibility to be of service uh, and partnership, obviously, with our community colleges because it's about the student. It's not about the institution. It's about the student. So we've been preaching that to make sure that we all follow that and adhere to that. In addition to that, uh, uh, easy things that we do um, are we host a number of events for high school students on our campus, math day, accounting day, journalism day, all of the things that young people are interested in and excited about. Beyond that, we have in our clinics, our dental clinic, um, we have a very fine program that provides uh, services for those who could not afford to have any kind of prior dental care. And so we do that, and we're very happy about that. 
In the ag side, we do a lot with our growers and producers and providing them with information, being a repository for them to help them if they have questions about the crop, what's happening to the soybeans, or something going on here. But those are the things and responsibilities that we have. So from a perspective of, of a great university, as those are the things we need to do. Uh, it's not only to teach and educate our students, conduct research, but we need to be of service to our populations. And just to kind of put this in perspective, I've been studying what is the impact of not only Carbondale, but Perry County, the county I grew up in. That's an annual payroll of $6.3 million provided by the university for people that live in, those, in that region. Uh, without that money, uh, that's going to be a very difficult situation for, for Perry County. And I can tell you that for any county. Um, actually, some in the north uh, we have employees. So, you know, it, it's a major responsibility. It's a big responsibility. It's one that we accept. And we're constantly looking for ways to think uh, again of what we can do uh, to be even more helpful. Our Martin Luther King activities generate a lot of regional support and activity. Black History Month has been extremely well received. That's not only for the, for the campus, that's for the region, the community, and the expectations to, to help all of us understand better our underrepresented populations and what we need to do uh, to advance all of humanity. If, if I could briefly uh, address your question as well. One of the things that I'm most excited about SIUE at the moment is something called Successful Communities Collaborative. We are writing contracts with cities in the area, so for example, Highland, Godfrey, Alton, and uh, these contracts uh, involve our students who are developing skills, so our nursing skills are helping with education programs uh, regarding health and, and drug abuse. Our uh, business public health students are working with communities on recycling programs and marketing programs. And so it gives the students a chance to actually practice the skills that they've learned at SIUE in serving the, the surrounding cities. I also would like to underscore, uh, as John said, that I think we provide valuable services uh, largely for free in particular areas. So for example, in East St. Louis, our dental school, our nursing school, provide uh, free uh, health care to individuals in those areas. Uh, dental school serves Alton in the same way on uh, Give Kids a Smile Day where we see hundreds of kids uh, come in and that free service is provided. So I think uh, that element of a university to provide service to the community is absolutely a part of our calling as a public university. And SIU School of Medicine was created in 1970 to train physicians, physician assistants, and other health care providers in the 66 counties of central and southern Illinois. Since then, we have four family medicine centers, Quincy, Carbondale, Decatur, and Springfield. Um, we train our residents there uh, in family medicine, and almost every one, I think every one of them uh, last year that graduated from our residency program in Carbondale stayed in Carbondale to to um, be employed and serve the region. So um, we, we serve a lot of services for um, patients and their families in Southern Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Further questions for this panel? Members? Sure, Senator Peters. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm looking at these capital projects. And I just want to know, um, so I, I looked up the tuition. Maybe I have a little bit wrong, but uh, SIUE is around $10,000 $10, in state. SIUC is around $13,000. Um, what do you project uh, tuition to be like after these capital projects? And will they go up or will they stagnate or will they go down? So At Carbondale, we have not increased tuition in the last four years. I don't see us increasing it next year unless there's a change. Edwardsville also is flat. And just to follow up, it will remain flat, you project? I think it would be more likely if these projects were funded. Yeah. yeah. All right. Further questions? Yep. Go so, um, so anyone can uh, answer the question. Uh, so how do you propose we should pay for this? I sit, I sit around the kitchen room table with my wife and my kids and my wife says, Marty, we need a new refrigerator. So that's great. I need the, 
and, you know, the gadgets, I need, I need this, I need, I need, I need. And so then the question comes around, all right, well, uh, honey, how are we going to pay for this? And, and then there's silence in the kitchen. Well, I, you know, I think the, the, the answer to that is if we make an investment and we return that on that investment, and as a state we continue to prosper and we become less of an exporter of talent, you know, Illinois and New Jersey are the two states that export more young people to other universities and colleges than any of the rest of the states. So I think the investment is, is, is such that if we make that investment, we attract that talent, we retain that talent here, and they don't feel angry about their state not responding to their needs. It's not only us. It's our advocacy for our students. The next generation. Mr. Chancellor, you're a lot smarter. I mean, you guys are a lot smarter than that. Not, that's, I, I cannot accept that answer. So, uh, are you, did you, maybe as one of the economists want to propose right. some revenue streams to help finance the millions of dollars of projects that the university is proposing. Well, Senator, I don't know if you'll like my answer either then. I, I don't know. Um, well, just don't dance around the answers. Well, just keep well, straight up. Well, was sitting around the kitchen table, there are some things, the cable bill, that I, I can't, I, I, you know, you either have the money for it or you don't. But on the other hand, replacing a 40-year-old furnace with a new furnace, that, that can be viewed as an investment, right? That, that, does, that can pay for itself, right? And so I, I think, as I say, it's not just a matter of, uh, of, of who's working while the stuff is being built. What are you going to have uh, once the investment is done? And again, I think uh, infrastructure, any infrastructure, but that can in, in improve the productivity of the next generation of workers. Again, that's also the next generation of taxpayers, right? And uh, so uh, if, if we, uh, anything that makes them more productive, increases their wages, that's going to increase tax revenues uh, in, in the future. Now, that's a difficult decision, right, uh, how, to, how to pay for these things. But, uh, but I, I think you'd be hard-pressed to come up with something that's closer to an, inbe an investment as opposed to a, as a splurge than, uh, than a university. So, so let me try again. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, former Governor Quinn, uh, he didn't like a gas tax, right? So we, we taxed shampoo and candy and tea and license plates and beer. Uh, spirits. So, uh, since you're not, since you guys are doing the old square dance around the answer, uh, you all support a gas tax? Hands up. I, I think we already pay gas tax, yeah, don't we? Yeah, okay. So, are you, you're asking, do we <laughs> an increase? Yeah, no, no gas tax. Uh, so that seems a, that seems like a no. Uh, license plate fees. Um, uh, freight? freight, taxing freight, yep. Yep. taxing pollution, Definitely. Um, Cheerios, <laughs> honey oat maybe. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, further questions okay. for this for this panel? Can I can I ask it another way? You know, in, in a more uh, have you all ever taken a position on revenue for capital investments, or and do you all plan on taking one when this capital plan moves forward? In another state, yes. Uh, my prior experience has been in Oregon, Utah, Connecticut, and Michigan. And I can tell you in Michigan, to maybe go after your point, <clears throat> we did get we we didn't get we only got thirty million of a of a $90 million building. We had to raise the rest ourselves. But I can tell you when that building was done, it was a, a, a Platinum LEED certified building, and the energy cost in that building was 50% of what it was prior to. Now, that's not a bad return on that investment over a period of years. So, I mean, there are lots of different ways to look at these things and to think about them, but yeah. The uh, most recent data that I've seen is that a person with a bachelor's degree compared to a high school will earn a million dollars more in their lifetime. A person with a graduate degree will earn two million dollars more in their lifetime. Uh, when you factor the uh, tax uh, on a million or two million dollars, uh, I think that, as we've been saying, that's an investment, uh, a way of uh, generating revenue. 
and I appreciate that. I, 